2011, and I was 27 and living in Buenos Aires. I'd been in a nasty little breakup with an Argentine girl we'll call Marisol. I had also apparently got her pregnant. It's funny. Nine years later, I can openly talk about it, but it's something neither my family nor my closest friends knew about at the time. For the record, she miscarried when I returned to the US for throat surgery and my grandmother's funeral. I had developed a tumor that was later determined to be benign after getting the flu. I'm not ashamed to admit that at the time, I felt relieved. I knew that if she had the baby, I would have to return to Buenos Aires to live permanently, because Marisol was like most Argentine women who were adamant about staying in their beloved Argentina. I also wasn't keen on a half-black and American baby growing up in Argentina. Anyway, at the time I had made some good friends in Buenos Aires that I still keep in touch with today. I think at the time I was under an extreme amount of pressure and needed people to talk to. I say this because I've always been an excellent judge of character. Somehow though, I didn't see the sinister intentions of one of my new friends. Looking back on it now, the warning signs were everywhere. His name was Bill. Today, I can't really remember how we met. I think it was at some expat function or a party. In any event, looking back on it now, Bill didn't even look all that friendly. He was a slightly overweight, average looking, bald white guy with an awkward shaped looking head. He may not have looked friendly, but he exuded confidence, charisma, and an overall feeling of just a friendly guy. We hit it off well and agreed to keep in touch. We started hanging out, going to the bars for drinks and to the clubs to party. It was like we became partners in crime. Nothing, and I mean nothing at the time alerted to me to his psychopathic tendencies. A little sidebar, I've always had this odd fascination with serial killers and psychology. I've come to the conclusion that most people conflate the sociopath with the psychopath and even psychologists and law enforcement disagree on this. The way I've come to understand it is that in your lifetime you'll meet many sociopaths and you'll know it. Psychopaths on the other hand, such as Ted Bundy and Rodney Alcala, the dating game killer, present themselves as normal people and are highly intelligent. So intelligent they are, they've learned how to appear normal in society while simultaneously lacking empathy and emotional connections that a normal person would display. They're also able to compartmentalize their nefarious behavior, leading normal lives with partners and children, while stealing or beating, or even killing. Most psychopaths are not killers, but all serial killers exhibit signs of psychopathy. As I understand it, sociopaths are far easier to spot they typically are not as cunning or intelligent, and are unable to hide their lack of empathy or disregard for breaking the law or hurting others. In a word, they only care about themselves. I'm sure most of us here have encountered someone like that in their lives. Cold, callous, and just not good people. All about them. And you know it. That's a sociopath. Again. Most sociopaths don't kill people. So, getting back to Bill. Bill was nice, charismatic, and a quote, good friend, who just seemed to be stressed with his finance business in Argentina. The man was smart, very smart. One night we went out to a club. On our way there, Bill started rustling things around his wallet and exclaimed, Fuck! You think I could borrow 100 pesos from you? At the time, 100 pesos was equivalent to about 20 US dollars. Sure man, of course, I replied. He said, don't worry, I'll pay you back. Yeah, cool man, no problem. 
So that was that, and I gave Bill the money. We ended up having a good time as usual and went home after that. About a week went by, and we had already met up a few times since we'd got out to the club, and he still hadn't returned the money. At the time, I wasn't in the best economical state and felt forced to ask for the money. It's something I hate doing and something I don't do often. With a quizzical look on his face, Bill replied, I gave it back to you already, remember? I replied, No, you didn't. Wait, did you? Yeah, of course, man. He was so good at lying. For a second or two, I actually questioned myself. Maybe I had just forgotten. But, the problem is, when you're broke, you remember anything related to money. I knew he hadn't returned it to me. We went back and forth for a minute until I said, Hey, it's fine if you don't have it, but you didn't give it back to me. Finally, when Bill realized I wasn't going to be swayed, he said, No, no, it's cool, man. I was just pretty sure I gave the money back to you. If you said I didn't, then I did it. I just could have sworn that you did. I wasn't even mad at him. I just figured the man was going through hard times. Money can do weird things to people. He ended up giving me back the money and I just shrugged the whole thing off. Nothing out of the ordinary happened to us after that. Until one day, a few months later, Bill called me. I had returned to LA for emergency surgery on my throat and my grandma's death. Hey Jackson, it's Bill. How are things? We exchanged the usual pleasantries until he explained the reason for his call. Listen man, I have a business proposition for you. So I have this insert vague idea here, and all I would need is your ID. With just your ID, you would be making $500 a month. Now at the time, I was young, jobless, and had temporarily moved back in with my parents. I know most of you out there are saying how could I be so stupid, but you must understand Bill was my friend. I trusted him. He had paid me back the money in the end that he believed he didn't owe me. I had no reason to suspect it was a scheme. I asked myself how I could have been taken, but that's just how psychopathic this guy was. Think Ted Bundy charismatic. Anyway, the weeks went by, then months. I would email Bill about the business and my money. At first, I would get short responses, until finally I got none. That's when I started feeling weird about things. The bells started ringing. And then, one day another friend of mine emailed me a link to an FBI bulletin. It turned out my friend Bill was an international fugitive. He was on the run from US authorities for fraud and had fled to Argentina. As if not to make matters worse, this man created a customer service sham business and defrauded dozens of people in the process, including me. I never talked to Bill again, but it's the first and only time in my life that I've met someone as cunning, calculated, and cold as William Buckley. I still have some of the emails he sent me when we were friends. It's really unbelievable. Then again, there's another story while I was in Argentina, where one of my other friends ended up threatening my life and whose father had connections to the Ukrainian Mafia. That's for another time, but thinking back to my time there, I was a fucking horrible judge of character. If you peruse any expat forums, it's not hard to find all the dirty deeds, as well as some links related to William Buckley. So there you have it, my first and hopefully only friendship with a true socio slash psychopath. Be wary of your friends, folks.
This is another story that happened in college. During my final year in college, I was living in a two-bedroom on-campus apartment with four other girls. My actual roommate, Christine, is a sweetheart, and we're still like sisters even now, after over ten years of friendship. That was our third year rooming together, and we even signed up for the same summer abroad programs. We like to joke we've used up all our roommate luck by finding each other, because all of our suite slash apartment mates were interesting. The other two girls sharing our apartment were Chelsea and Brittany. Chelsea was normal, but Brittany was problematic. She would always bring different guys home every night, which was fine, except for the fact that she was in a relationship with a cop who carried a gun everywhere with him and had serious anger and jealousy issues. Oh, and she'd have sex all over every surface of the apartment. The night this incident happened, there was a St. Patrick's Day party with free concerts happening in the school, so there were loads of people on campus. Brittany and Chelsea had gone off to party, but Christine and I decided to stay at home to binge on Friends reruns because we're so lame. In the middle of our Friends binge session, we heard someone hammering at our door. Hey, can you let me in? I need to borrow your phone. It was a male voice. We immediately assumed it was one of Brittany's guys. Sometimes they would make up stories just to get into our apartment, then refuse to leave until she comes back so they can hook up slash get into shouting matches, usually cheating related. What should we do? Christine whispered to me. I knew what she wanted, but she was too nice to say it, so I said it for her. Let's pretend we're not in and not answer. We were in no mood to entertain a guy for a few hours while he waited for Brittany to get back. The guy banged on our door and asked to borrow our phone several times, but eventually gave up and left. We had fun watching the rest of the episode, when our phones buzzed. We both checked our phones and it was an automatically generated campus-wide alert text. There was a stabbing on campus. It was in our very apartment, and happened in the unit right above ours. The stabber was an unidentified male, and he was still on the loose. I looked at Christy and asked her, Uh, could it be... She looked unsure but went, Nah, it couldn't. Yeah, it couldn't. We made sure we barricaded the door to our room before we slept though in case Brittany brought Mr. Stabby home. I mean, she doesn't, and I mean that in present tense, have the best taste in men. The next day, we read the school paper to find out more about the incident. Apparently, the guy knocked on the victim's door, asking to borrow her phone. She let him in, and as soon as he was inside her apartment, he grabbed a knife from the kitchen countertop and stabbed her multiple times in the stomach. He was a complete stranger, and it seems that his only motivation was to stab someone. Since the campus was filled with thousands of people during the party, the guy easily slipped into the crowd and disappeared. Our apartment was on the ground floor and right next to the stairs. If someone was to go knocking on every apartment, ours was most likely right before the victim's apartment. Christine and I definitely spent a few minutes shouting, Holy shit! Holy shit! Oh my god, holy shit! Turned out, having a shitty apartment mate may have saved us. And yes, there was an article about it in the news. Here's a detail that isn't in that article. The apartment was Levy 6. If you were a fellow lion during that time, You'd remember that it was a month after there was a shooting over a high school basketball game hosted on campus. Fortunately for me, I was graduating in two months, so my mom couldn't pull me out of LA and make me move back to Indonesia ASAP. And yes, my mom received the alert too, knew our apartment's layout, and so she also pieced everything together and realized it could have been me or Christine. <laughs> 